completely different, but also starting out with maps. Um, I'll be talking about how we make a 3D map of the universe. It's work that we're doing at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab with around 200 other collaborators around the world. Um, of course, making maps of the universe is nothing new. Um, the ancient Babylonians, Assyrians, Mayans, Chinese, Greeks, you know, they, they've been doing this for a long time. Um, sometimes making those maps was for, for very practical reasons, for things like understanding the seasons for agriculture or for um, navigation. Sometimes it was just sort of understanding our place in the universe. And uh, the modern map making we're doing now is more of that latter form of understanding our place in the universe, understanding the history and fate. Um, we're not going to make your cell phones better or make a better TV for you. We're just, you know, it's for, you know, part of what great societies do is understand our place. And even some of those ancient maps, you know, still have impact today with things like, you know, the constellations, Orion and Taurus and the Zodiac. You know, these are things that come back from, you know, many, many you know, thousands of years ago. Um, but what we're doing today, I want to just sort of um, to give some basic terminology because not everyone is so familiar with it. Um, so planets are things like the Earth, um, things like Jupiter or Mars. They orbit our sun, that's a, a single star. The solar system is the collection of planets orbiting our star. Um, for the types of maps I'm talking about, that is really, really tiny. We're looking way, way beyond that. Within our galaxy, there's many, many stars, around 300 billion stars. But even that is really tiny compared to the size of the maps that we're looking at making. We're going out to the universe where there's around 100 billion galaxies, each of which has many, many billions of stars. And we're trying to look back at that. Some of the light that we're looking at has been traveling to us for almost 13 billion years. That left those stars and arrived at us today. And we're making a map of where those things are located. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about how we do it and a little bit about why we do it. Um, so the first on the how for making a 3D map of the universe, the first two dimensions are basically like a latitude and longitude. Um, that's the easy part. You, know, you can look at a satellite image and make a map of where things are. The harder part is figuring out how high stuff is or how far away it is in the third dimension. So for getting those first two dimensions, you start by just taking a picture of the sky. And then you go look for little blobs and big sort of fuzzy blobs or galaxies that are probably a long ways away. And things that are nice round tiny points are probably stars. Or they might be a really small galaxy really far away. You know, that's that third dimension that's hard. Well, you start by just taking a picture and measuring where stuff is. And that gives you those, those first two dimensions of your map. To do that, um, the Sloan Digital Sky Survey was one of the pioneers of this, where they took a 120 megapixel custom camera attached it to a new telescope, and started imaging the sky. And a typical human eye can see at a certain resolution. These telescopes can see almost 100 times sharper an image than you can see with your eye. And so to actually map out the sky, it takes a long time. They spent 10 years taking pictures of the sky. And they only covered about a third of the sky, which is a good fraction of the sky that you can see from the northern hemisphere. But the way they did this was sort of like when you have your cell phone and you take a, a panorama photo and you kind of scan it across a room or something like that. They did that with the sky. They took these panorama photos across the sky in one stripe, and then another stripe, and then another stripe. And they start putting those images together. And so in this image, you can see you know, some of the stripes are going along this direction, and other stripes are going along that direction. And you start putting together um, these maps in different directions on the universe. And if you take this little section here and zoom in on it, you can see like there's a, a galaxy at the center of that. You take that red box and you zoom in a little further, and you get you know a, a bigger picture of that galaxy. You can zoom in even further and just look at how many you know many thousands of stars are in that one image, and that's all just zoom in, zoom in, zoom in, zoom in. You know your human eye, if you go all over the world, look at every piece of the sky, north and south, you can see around 9,000 stars, and we're looking at billions of stars in these maps that we're putting together. And that's even just you know, starting to scratch the edge of what's actually out there. So for example, this image here, that's 0.0002% of the data from the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. So the result of this was they ended up making a, a million megapixel, or a <coughs> pixel image of the universe, of a color picture of the sky. Um, it, it had half a billion stars and galaxies that were identified in this picture. 
Um, and one of the best things about it is 230 terabytes of data, and it's all free. So, you know, if you have a really big hard drive, you can go download this data. Um, you know, it's used by high school students and universities that can't afford to go off and buy their own telescope and do this kind of thing. We're really proud that three quarters of the papers published on this data set do not come from our collaboration. And so basically by just every year, we give away all of the data that we've taken through the previous year. And we've quadrupled the impact of our collaboration just by making that data freely available to anyone, anywhere who wants to use it. Um, you take all of the, the Hubble Space Telescope results combined, add up to about the same number of citations as this one project. So you know, the, the power of free data, it's great. So now switching, you know, that was the easy part, the, the first two dimensions on the sky. Getting that radial distance is, is the hard part. So there's two methods we use. Um, one is like if you're looking at, say, these lampposts going in this image, you can say, well, things that are brighter are probably closer to me, or things that are dim are probably far away, or things that look bigger are probably closer, and things that look smaller are probably further away. But the trick is you have to have something that you actually kind of know what the size is. You know, if you're down at the mystery spot in Santa Cruz, they'll play with your mind by making things that look bigger, but they're actually smaller, and you know, the, the distances are all messed up because the things aren't the same size. And so in astronomy, we have to go look for things that we know are all of them are intrinsically the same brightness, or all of them are intrinsically the same size. And so for the things that are the same brightness, we go to something called a supernova, which is an exploding star. It's the end of its life cycle of the star. And unlike our sun, which is just a single sun with planets around it, many, many stars are actually in a binary system where two stars are spinning around each other. And if one of them is very large and one of them is smaller, the smaller one can be stealing matter from the larger one. And a certain kind of star, these carbon oxygen white dwarfs, they basically they steal matter from their neighbor until they collapse under their own weight. And it, it's sort of like Einstein's e equals mc squared. You know, the energy is the mass you know, times the speed of light squared. And when they collapse under their own weight, there's a very specific mass at which they collapse. And so that gives a very specific amount of energy that they explode at, which gives them a uniform brightness. And so it doesn't matter whether they're close or far, they're always the same brightness. And then if it looks brighter, it means it's closer. And if it looks dimmer, it means it's further away. Um, when they do go off, they can be billions of times brighter than the sun. They're really, really bright, which is good, because we can see them very far away. Unfortunately, they're very rare. They only go off about once a century in a, a typical galaxy like the Milky Way. And so you know, there's not many of them out there. And they're really hard to find because when they do go off, they spend about two weeks getting brighter, and then they spend about a month getting dimmer again. And so you've got sort of this six-week window about every 100 years per galaxy to actually find these things. The good news is, as I said before, there is you know, something like 100 billion galaxies out there. And so you just have to go look at a lot of, lot of galaxies and try to find these things. So this is a, a particularly um, dramatic example from four years ago, where we have this nice whirlpool galaxy that um, a group was taking an image almost every night of this galaxy. And if you look at this location here, there was nothing there on one night. They came back the next night, and boom, there was something really bright, brighter than any other individual star in this location. And so they caught it like almost immediately after it exploded, and they were able to watch it get brighter and brighter and then dimmer and dimmer, and use that as a measure of the distance to this galaxy. A more typical example looks kind of like this. You have sort of a fuzzy blob, and then a couple days later, you come back and you get a slightly differently shaped fuzzy blob. And if you subtract one from the other, you can see a smaller fuzzy blob, and that was the supernova that went off. And you track it, measuring it every couple days, and watching it get brighter and then dimmer again. But because these are so rare, you know, this, for example, a project at Lawrence Berkeley Lab, the nearby supernova factory, this is one ten millionth of the data that they observe every night looking for these very, very rare objects. But in the end, we can put together thousands of these supernova and measure the distances to thousands of locations on the sky. And we have billions of things in the map, but getting those radial distances are, are much harder. So switching over to the other thing, instead of having the brighter things being closer, we're now going to look at how the bigger things are closer. One of the cool things of working in sort of these you know, cosmology areas is, um, you know, in this case, we're going all the way back to the Big Bang. 
So when the universe was super early and dense, there was literally sound waves propagating through the universe. And as the universe is expanding out from the Big Bang, it's cooling off. And at some point, those sound waves literally just freeze out. And so we have these ripples um, in the sky that if there was only a few sound waves propagating outward, you would see sort of rings of where the matter was left over from the sound waves going out. Um, reality is much denser than that. It's not just a couple of rings, but it's many, many rings all superimposed on each other. And we're looking for this, this pattern of rings on the sky that are all overlapping each other. But the standard ruler part of this is that we can calculate how long it took the universe to expand to the size that these rings froze out. And so we know how large those rings are. And then when we look on the sky, if we see a really big ring, it means it's close. And if we see a really tiny ring, it means it's far away. Of course, it's not seeing an individual ring like we, we had this artist draw for us. But it's, it's statistically the, the probability that if I have a galaxy at this location, what's the probability that there will be another galaxy at a certain distance away that corresponds to the size of that ring? And we put this all together statistically by measuring the locations of many thousands up to millions of these galaxies. So I advertised a 3D map of the universe. I'm now actually going to move on to a fourth dimension. And that's the, the radial velocity. So not only are we measuring sort of where things are in those first two dimensions and where it is in that third dimension, but we can also measure, is it moving towards us or is it moving away from us? And so you're standing on the street corner and you hear like a motorcycle come by. It goes, Ew! And you have that high pitch as it's coming towards you and the low pitch as it's going away from you. There's a similar effect with light, that things that are moving towards us are slightly bluer and things that are moving away from us are slightly redder. For like normal objects with us, we're moving slow enough, you don't see this effect, but when you're on sort of galactic, intergalactic universe scales, things are moving so fast, you can actually measure this. And so instead of taking like your camera that has a red, blue, and green sensor in it, you take it and you spread the light out like a prism, and you get thousands of measurements of blue light to red light. What I'm showing here is a spectrum of what a supernova looks like where you have sort of more light that's blue and then less light and then more light and less light as you go to redder and redder light. And then you take a picture of another supernova with this spectrum and you see the same features but they're all shifted over. And they're shifted redward which means that supernova is moving away from us. And so in addition to measuring where its location is on the sky and its radial distance out, we can also tell its motion in the universe. And so when you put these things together, that's called the Hubble diagram, where on, on one axis you plot the redshift, or its velocity as it's moving away from you, and on the other axis, axis you plot its distance. And the relationship between its motion through the universe and its distance is related by the cosmology of what the universe is made out of, and what the, the laws of physics are that describe it. This was a program done um, at Lawrence Berkeley Lab in Harvard and a few other um, locations around the world. Um, about 15 years ago, and these different lines drawn on this diagram show different expectations of what the universe might be made out of. And the expectation at the time was the Big Bang blows stuff up, everything's going out, but they expected that gravity was like going to be slowing it down, because gravity's pulling in, the Big Bang had pushed it out. And so they're trying to measure the decelerations, like you throw a ball up in the air, and even though you know, it's still moving up, it's slowing down, eventually turns around, falls back. They wanted to measure you know, how much was that deceleration. If they had actually measured deceleration, all of these points up here would have been on the bottom of those lines. Instead, they measured all of those points as being a little high. And they spent a number of years thinking that their grad students and postdocs had screwed up and you know, had flipped some sign or something like that. Um, but there was another group working on the same um, thing with a different data set. And they found the same effect. And word leaked between the two projects that both of them were seeing this effect that distant things were actually a little dimmer further away than they should have been, which was a sign that the universe, even though it was expanding outward, it was actually getting faster and faster and faster. And instead of gravity slowing things down as it went out, there was something that was pushing back against gravity and making it get even faster and faster in that acceleration. And so the big surprise from that work was <laughs> what the universe is made out of. Um, it turns out that normal matter, stuff that we're made out of, you know, protons, neutrons, electrons, that turns out to only be about 4% of the universe. 
And actually, most of that is just hydrogen in like stars and gas out there. Stuff that you and I are actually made of, you know, nitrogen and calcium, um, you know, stuff like that, is actually you know, a tiny sliver of what's out there. There's another thing we call dark matter that it doesn't shine, it doesn't make stars, but it does gravitationally attract light matter. And then this effect of things pushing out against gravity turns out to be almost three quarters of the universe is dominated by this stuff. And we know almost nothing else about it. But that's what we're trying to, to tell with these maps. It was such a, a surprising result that these groups won the Nobel Prize for it. So you know, one of the reasons for doing this is just to understand the universe. Another reason is you can get a Nobel Prize for doing it. Um, then in the, the end of this talk into how we actually go about measuring all of these galaxies to make this map. Um, so this takes us to the third generation of the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, this telescope down in New Mexico. And basically, you take all the locations of the galaxies you want to measure, you take a piece of aluminum, and you drill holes in the locations of those galaxies. You then have a human plug fiber optic cables into that, those holes, and you mount this thing on the telescope. Here's a little map showing, uh, or video in slightly faster than real time showing a person plugging these fiber optic cables into this plate. Our best plugger has done over a million of these cables in her lifetime. The other end of those fiber optic cables go off to basically a fancy prism and digital camera to be measuring those spectra of all of those galaxies so you can get that, that radial distance. You take that cart and you mount it on the telescope. We can do up to 9,000 galaxies a night and over the course of many years we can build up the locations of millions of galaxies. It's simple, effective, but it doesn't scale very well when we want to go larger. So another project we're working on, we want to go to a larger telescope so we can go to fainter, more distant objects. We want to get more sky area so we can make a bigger map. And we want to get rid of the humans and you know, not wear out their fingers. We want to go to 5,000 fiber optic cables instead of 1,000. And we have 5,000 little robots doing all of that positioning, where those fiber optic cables will go. And so we start out with this sort of pizza wedge that we plug all of these little robots into. And each robot holds one fiber, moves it into the location. We take our image. We move to another location. It moves again, takes another image. And we do this many, many times. And so then, you know, I've gotten to four dimensions. I'm even going to go to a fifth one. Another future project called LSST will be getting us the time dimension of the universe. They'll be based down in Chile. And twice a week, they'll be taking an image of the entire sky. So that, that program that took 10 years with the Slow and Digital Sky Survey, they'll be doing it twice a week. It's, you know, technology moves on. Um, but you get a movie of how the universe changes, everything that's going on. Um, and so, you know, whether it's a supernova going off or asteroids moving or other kinds of stars exploding, we'll be getting that time dimension, how the universe is, is burgling along. I'm going to skip the summary slide and just take it to a, a movie put together by the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. It has a little bit of cheesy music to go with it. Um, but each one of these points is a galaxy we measured. So it's the, the three-dimensional location of it and the image that we took of that galaxy. And as we're scanning out, so right now the Sloan Digital Sky Survey is on its 12th data release. So this is data release 4 when they made the pretty movie. Um, so this is only about a, a third of the data. And so as we scan out further, you'll start to see some sections of the sky that we were able to observe and other sections that we hadn't observed yet. But you know, as you, you're getting out further and further, you can start seeing some of these large-scale structures that we're measuring to get those you know, bigger things or, or you know, Things that look bigger or closer, or further away. But I just, you know, that's, that's all of our data. data. Um, so at this point, we're maybe eight billion light years across. The universe is only thirteen and a half and a little more um, light years old. So this is like really old stuff. So here you can see the sections of the sky we hadn't observed yet at the time we made this movie. These uh, cyan points are the things that are around twelve billion light years away. And then this outer core here is actually, I didn't talk about this, but this goes back to the Big Bang, the cosmic microwave background. It's literally light that came from the Big Bang that's been streaming to us for those 13.8 billion years and finally arriving at our telescopes nowadays. And you put all of these pieces together to make the map of the universe to help understand our, our place in it and then give all the data away and let people write publications about it. Thank you.